Hey there, everybody. This is George from DinosaurGeorge.com, answering the questions from around the world. This is video number 183, and the highlighted item for this video is my chapter book. It is item 1020. It's called Raptor Island. It's a, it's a story I came up with years ago and finally put it down into book form. Um, if you like chapter books, I think you'll enjoy this. It basically, it's where a younger me travels back in time to look for a lost uncle. It's a lot of fun. It's really kind of cool. Uh, it sells for $8 and you can find it on our catalog and you can find our catalog link on this video. Okay. Let's get into it. Sheldon from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hey, Mr. Blessing, I hope you're doing well. I am, and thank you for the Mr. Part. You can call me George if you want, Sheldon. Do you believe that T-Rexes in Jurassic Park movies are designed exactly how they would be based on the fossil skeleton, specifically the head? I know that Spielberg and co -cons had co-consulted with a lot of different paleontologists for each film, but whenever I see the T-Rex skeleton, its head looks a lot smaller in proportion to the body than it does in the film. Sheldon, one of the things that happens in film and television is that um, science takes a backseat to entertainment. And even though they use paleontologists for consulting, I think that they still are more interested in how something looks and if giving it a bigger head makes it look more menacing, they're going to do that. It's, a, it's, it's simply what happens. There's nothing you can do about it. So I don't know with any certainty if, the, if, if it is properly scaled the way it is. I just know that they give it the look that they do because they think it looks more interesting and looks exceed the science. So I'm guessing, who knows, maybe they simply made it look more menacing. All right, Emil from Denmark. Hey, DG, what do you think about the fact that dinosaurs might have had whiskers? Also, if I ever found a new uh, Neovenator dinosaur, I would name it Yokovenator. Huh. Last but not least, was Postasuchus a biped or a quadruped? Okay, dinosaur whiskers. You know, whiskers are something that evolved to help animals hunt in the dark, especially mammals, little mammals. I don't know if dinosaurs would have needed them unless they were nocturnal. Because if you're out during the day, whiskers don't serve any purpose whatsoever. They're made to help alert you to the what's in front of you and beside you and possibly what's living around you. So unless it's a tiny little dinosaur, who strictly hunts at night, I don't think whiskers are of any value. Um, I think whiskers are better suited for mammals, but that's just my opinion. Uh, as for Postasuchus, is he a biped or a quadruped? Postasuchus is walking around on four legs. Could he raise up on his back legs? Maybe so. All animals have something called a center of gravity. Your center of gravity is kind of the middle of the scale, how you balance. If your center of gravity is over your back legs, standing up is very easy to do. But if your center of gravity is where your stomach is, or if it's by your front legs, you simply cannot stand up very easily. Elephants' center of gravity is the center of their stomach, not their hind legs. That's why an elephant has a hard time rearing up and standing on his hind legs. So when you look at Postasuchus, I believe its center of gravity is probably its stomach. Maybe it is the back legs. But whatever the case is, I don't know what, would, what the benefit of standing up would be for that animal. He's not attacking things that are taller than him, and even if he is, standing up is not the same as being agile and moving around. you got that big tail dragging the ground behind you. So maybe they stood up, sort of the way Komodo dragons stand up next to each other and have a pushing match to see who's the strongest and knock the other guy down. Maybe they had the ability, but I don't necessarily think they were using that as a way to give them an advantage when they were hunting. All right, Luigi from Manila, the Philippines. Hello, DG. I am an attentive viewer to your videos and also a big fan. Well, thank you, Luigi. You know what? I think I just answered one of your questions on a previous video, so good. I hope you're doing well. My question centers around giant marine reptiles like plesiosaurs, large mosasaurs, and chronosaurs whose bite forces have not been calculated. Do you think they could rival Megalodon's bite force of 18 tons? Thank you very much for answering my question and have a wonderful day. Luigi, thank you, my friend. I hope you have a wonderful day as well. Did they need that kind of a bite force? No, probably not. Because Megalodon is best suited for hunting whales. 
And in order to get through the mass and to break through the bones to get to the internal organs to kill them, you've got to have a massive bite force. I don't think any of these other guys are doing that. Based on what I know, they seem to be swallowing everybody whole. So if you have a jaw that is made to swallow whole the things you eat, then you don't really require that massive bite force because it doesn't really do you that much good. So my guess would be that they probably didn't, even though I've never seen any reports, my guess would be they probably didn't need that kind of a bite force. All right, John from Gold Coast, Australia. Hey, Dinosaur George, I'm a huge fan of yours and would like to ask you a question. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. Were there any scaly or non-feathered dromaeosaurs? Wow. Thanks for answering my questions, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, John. hope your day is going well. Were there any scaly or non-feathered dromaeosaurs? You know, I think the, the recognition that some theropods were feathered made us all jump to conclusions that everything has to be feathered, that everything was feathered. I simply don't agree with that. Feathers that cover the body have a purpose. And the bigger you are, the less of a necessity feathers become. So I don't, I'm not willing to jump on that bandwagon with the word all theropods are feathered. I, I simply don't believe that. Now it may be true, but I don't, I don't subscribe to that notion. So I think that Utah Raptor would be an example of one that maybe didn't need feathers necessarily. As for being scaly, I don't think they've ever found anything that would suggest that any dinosaur would be scaly. All of the dinosaur skin that I've seen, whether mummified or impression, always is more pebbly, like almost like the leg of a turtle or a tortoise, you know what I mean? Not overlapping scales like a lizard or a snake, sort of beaded like a, like a, um, a Gila monster. That's more of what their skill, skin kind of seems like. So my guess would be that there probably were no scaly ones, but were there non-feathered? Probably so. All right, Hayden from Lincoln, England. Hi, DG. I love this channel, and I hope you're doing well. Thank you, buddy. Glad you like this channel. I recently watched a TV program about dinosaurs in Britain, and I found out about a new dinosaur I've never heard of called Neovenator. I was wondering what you think about the dinosaur and what other information you have about it. Did Neovenator and Baryonyx ever meet, and who would win in a fight? Thanks for the answer, and have a great day. Thank you, buddy. I don't know enough about Neovenator. What I know is he's medium-sized, and he's a theropod, and that's truly it. I, I apologize so much, Hayden. I, see, the problem with all of these questions, you guys, I don't have any opportunity to pre-read your question. I don't have any chance to do any sort of research to answer. I, I'm so sorry. I am literally shooting from the hip from memory on a lot of these, and Neovenator is one of those that I just don't know enough about. Now, if it lived with Baryonyx, I don't know if it did or not, I know Baryonyx, from what I know, is much larger than Neovenator. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I think he's much larger, and my guess would be Neovenator probably kept its distance from Baryonyx. I don't, I don't think they would ever fight. You know, sometimes we talk about animals fighting all the time, but that's more of a human quality that we're applying to them. Most predators don't fight with other predators. That's the last resort. First thing they want to do is get you to get out of their territory, and that's usually done through intimidation. So I don't know if they would have fought or not, but what I know about them is I think Baryonyx is larger. All right, finally, Everin from Lexington, Massachusetts. Hey, DG, I'd like to know if Sorophaganax was more of a predator or a scavenger. If it was more of a predator, I'd like to know what its prey was. Thank you for your time, and thanks for interest in reading this. Thank you, Everin. It's hap I'm happy to answer this. Okay, Sorophaganax is a big, big dinosaur, massive dinosaur. Its prey is probably going to consist of things like Camptosaurus, maybe Stegosaurus, probably young sauropods, probably Camarasaurus, but probably young sauropods are some of the bigger guys, Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus. So that's probably his prey. I think he's simply too big to be a scavenger. Being a scavenger, you have to have two things to be a scavenger. One, you have to cover a tremendous distance without using any energy. That's why vultures are scavengers. That's why I do not believe T-Rex or big predators are scavengers. They cannot traverse 
hundreds of miles in a day without burning more energy than they can ever recover. And to be a scavenger, things just don't die in your neighborhood every day. So you've got to go out and hunt for them, and I don't believe they could do that. I think they would burn more energy than they recover. So number one, you have to travel tremendous distances. Number two, you have to have, or you don't need equipment that you would otherwise need for hunting. In other words, you don't have recurved teeth because they only serve the purpose that when you bite into an animal and it's pulling to get away, it is driving the teeth farther into the animal to allow you to rip out a bigger chunk. Recurved teeth are of no value if what you're eating is already dead. You don't need to dig deeper into in, to inflict an injury. In fact, what you really want is to pull off little pieces to eat. So recurved teeth don't make any sense. So he couldn't travel long distances and he didn't have recurved, or he did have recurved teeth. So in my opinion, he is not a scavenger, but that's my guess. Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys enjoy these. Uh, it will be a while before I can get a few more up because I'm getting ready to be gone for a couple of weeks on the road, but I'll try my best to post them when I get back. Until later, have a great day, everybody. Take care of yourself. Be kind to people around you. It's so much easier to be nice than it is to be a jerk. Until later, I'll see you guys then.